Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. Okay, so I think Ant-Man and Wasp is like a solid six or seven out of the 21. <laughs> <laughs> we got Thor Ragnarok at the top, then great. Black Panther. Just jumping right in. Then, you know, maybe Iron Man 1. Iron Man 1's way up on the list. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. They were starting oh, the Ragnarok. I see. I see. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm just. I'm just joking. You know, I, just, uh, I didn't mean I, to jump right into I, it. I was on the plane last week and I watched. Uh, I watched Civil War again. Mm-hmm. No, That's... sorry, Winter Soldier. I watched Winter Soldier again. Yes. And holy cow, that was fantastic. Winter Soldier, like that. That it's one of my favorites. There's no. There's no slack time in Winter Soldier. Either you're learning about about Natasha and mm-hmm. and and uh, Captain America, or there's these amazing fight sequences. The freeway thing is amazing. The the Sam Jackson cattle. Uh, yeah, it's suburban shocking chase. how much happens in the film. Like in the beginning of the film, I'm like, oh, this is the film with the elevator fight. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, was, and that, we got a, a long way to go to get there. Yeah. Well, and honestly, the only place that it gets slow for me is in the final scene in the three hel- three helicopter helicarrier fights. Mm-hmm. Like the the whole tortured it, bit with Bucky is the weakest drags. part of the whole movie. It, yeah. it drags just a tiny bit. Yeah. But but I mean the the denouement with Robert Redford. I love watching Jenny Auger kick some ass. Yep. Um, um, um. What's his name? Um. The guy who played the the not uh, Red Skull, not Hugo Weaving, but the 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 scientist nerd. Oh from yeah. The first one. Terrifying. Who ends up getting sucked into the computer? Uh-huh, yeah. yeah, it's great. It's really good. It was really good. Um. Yeah. So uh, a movie that came out five years ago. Is it yeah. really? Turns out a five-year-old movie can still be good. Norm. Yeah, shocking. Um, I also watched uh, at your recommendation. I watched Ant Man and Ant Man and Wasp, mm-hmm. which I hadn't gotten around to. And shockingly, everyone's right. Those are both delightful, Paul wonderful great, movies. It turns out, who knew? I I very much think it's hilarious that even Paul Rudd has to include a off shirt scene. Yes, when he's right. like in the bathtub. Look, like, like, it's, if you're a Marvel superhero, there has to be a scene in which you don't have your shirt. Four quadrants. Yeah. What's that? All four quadrants. All four quadrants? You know, demographics. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Olds, <laughs> men, women, youngs. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's something for everyone. I didn't yeah. realize it was a spread spectrum like that. Yeah. Yeah. They, they um, plot it on a Venn diagram. Good movies, good villains, mm-hmm. um, lovely tech, really fun physical comedy. Uh, and I love specifically... Those two movies have a, an irreverence to the screenwriting humor that I find very enjoyable. Characters are constantly not they're not quite breaking the fourth wall, but they're breaking the fourth wall of conversational etiquette by commenting in meta ways upon the actual conversation. That and it's having. a nice sidestep from the, the seriousness of all the other Marvel films that surround it from totally. Civil War to Infinity War. Uh, Ant-Man participating in Civil War, and they address the fact. I mean, they make it a plot point. Mm-hmm. Why wasn't the Wasp involved? And, and you know, why, why Ant-Man? Yeah. yeah, or why wasn't Wasp involved in in um, in C- Civil War? Oh, right. You know, he left and did it on his own, and that's what caused their relationship to crumble. Not a big spoiler. Uh, <laughs> that, that happens in the first three minutes of the yeah. movie. Or I also, also like that this was. They're both directed by Peyton Reed, and of course, the first film had the specter of Edgar Wright leaving the film, mm-hmm. and so a lot of the talk of that because quote unquote creative differences of what was Edgar Wright's contribution versus right. what was Peyton Reed's contribution, and the second film doesn't have that at all because. It it is full paint and read. And I actually think the second film is funnier. Yeah. I mean, and that's not to say that the, I mean, who, none of us will ever know the full story about how the first one gets made, right? I mean, yep. you know, Solo suffers from this and so does Rogue One, right? There were, there were movies that they were making and they radically changed direction and remade whole giant chunks of it. So there's no way to know, but I actually think the second one made me laugh out loud a bunch more. And, and you said good villains, but it's also a, uh, a movie doesn't have like the sinister villain, right? The antagonist, and there are two antagonists. You have Ghost, sympathetic character, and you have um, the the uh, the arms dealer, the the, the tech dealer, uh, mm-hmm. who is more for comic relief than anything. It is, yeah, yeah. You don't have the you don't have the uh, the ubiquitous shot of the villain killing a kitten. Well, he uh, and twisting a kitten, which head. you have in in the first one because it's Corey Stroll playing just the mirror image. You know, the very classic. The origin story, well, the villain is just the mirror of the the hero. The, you know, Ant Man or uh, Iron Man was the same. Iron Monger was just a mirror of Iron Iron Man, and uh, God, Yellow Jacket was his vi- the villain's name. 
in the first Ant-Man. Yeah, see, no one remembers because that's oh, a very right. forgettable part of that movie. Well, I mean, it, it sets up the whole thing because it, it's then. It, I mean, you need that for the for the for um, Michael Douglas and and Paul Rudd to have a common have a common enemy. Also, the, uh, um, the the the. the I haven't read much about this, but the youngifying yeah. of older oh, Hollywood yeah. actors for flashback scenes is getting so much better. It's like the young Michael Douglas shots were blew my mind to a certain extent. Oh, there's still hints of Jeff Bridges in those young Michael Douglas <laughs> shots. Like you can see, you can see that that shiny Barbie face Just there. The, it's ever it's getting slighter and slighter. It's, and slighter. it's better. It's They're a bolder. Bit better. I mean, Disney. I don't know if they, they, the first, they didn't pioneer this, but one of the first notable uses of this was in Tron Legacy when they had. Oh, that scene, then that was, I think, what you're referring, referring to. That's what I was referring to. Yeah. It's, it's a, that, that one's a little bit difficult. I appreciated the fact that in Thor, uh, sorry. In Guardians of the Galaxy two, mm-hmm. the Kurt Russell flashback stuff was all makeup. The combination. Oh, combination. was it? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Makeup is heavily credited, it's, but it is the combination. It's so funny, right? Like when we made episode one, and Lucas was making all the talk show circuits, was talking about how much of this film was CG. He was really proud of it, and it was the selling point. Like yeah. we got rid of all the models, and he kept on showing these shots of models. Right, so every time I guarantee you, every time there was a shot, or a sequence where he was like, "Yeah, we did this whole thing CG," they would show a crashing pod racer, and all of the pod race explosions were practical. Well, and it's amazing because after people saw that movie, the thing that they said was, "Yeah, we we would like less CG next time, probably." <laughs> right, like the <laughs> right. like the reaction yeah. from audiences was universally, "Oh, you made a whole character out of CG." I mean, did you ever stop to think whether that was a good idea or not? And it seems like, yeah, maybe not. Yeah. I yeah. don't know. Um, I also, yeah. I went to, for the first time, I visited the Mill Valley Film Festival last week. Oh, oh how's we've, that? It's wonderful. And I got to see uh, Jason Reitman's upcoming movie, The Front Runner, starring Ooh. Hugh Jackman and Vera Farmiga about the Gary Hart, about the implosion of Gary Hart's presidential campaign. Oh, that was back when, it, when, I, when like an infidelity crisis could bring down a presidential candidate, huh? Shocking. Those were good so times. It is. It's coming out on election day. Oh, great. It's coming out on Tuesday the 6th. 6th of November. Um, it's fantastic. Oh, cool. Um, if you like old political plot pot boilers like The Candidate, this is right up your alley. It is, um, first of all, the degree to which they nailed the 80s wriggling to the wall is phenomenal. Minus the Apple Watch that was in the one promo photo. Oh, is what? there there's, really? <laughs> there's the first promo photo. You see Hugh Jackman and then one of the reporters. It's like, is that is that a time traveler right there? Uh, it, it's really, really great. Uh, and the performances are all great. I mean, this is a movie populated with, oh my God, it's Kevin Pollack. Oh, wow, it's Alex Kaberski. Yeah, it's all of these wonderful actors in the background. So speaking of a movie that has a ton of wonderful actors yeah. sprinkled liberally throughout, I watched Hotel Artemis the other night. You watch? Hotel Artemis. <laughs> Hotel Artemis, right, which, okay. Which the trailers for made me think it was kind of like like John Wickian fan John fiction John Wickian meets Assault on Precinct Yeah, that, like that was exactly yeah. my, like the reductive Hollywood thing. So uh, this yeah. is the Jodie Foster plays the aging nurse of a of a of a, 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 a gangland hospital in the middle of yeah, Sanctuary like Los Angeles. Hospital. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Subscription based, you know, murder boy right. hospital. This is where your healthcare yeah. is going. So people. basically, like we're two years away from that. <laughs> and um, I heard everybody loves politics on the podcast. So, <laughs> yeah, like we so should just bring just that keep up a it lot. Up. Yeah. <laughs> They're coming for you. But anyway, um, so what yeah, did like, you think? I got so, 20 minutes into Hotel Artemis and I turned it off. I stopped. I was like, if all of these characters are shitbirds, I don't care about so, them. So that's the thing is they don't end up. Almost all the characters end up getting redemptive arcs. Ah, which, so I, I stopped and they don't once I met that Sophia Butella and she was, right? That's yeah, her, Sophia yeah. Butella. I saw Sophia Butella being kind of a jerk and I was like, I just, I don't, I don't have it right the, So, but it's, 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 it's Charlie Day, Sophia Butella, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, Jodie Foster, Jody Foster, Jenny Dave Slate, Bautista. Dave Bautista, Jenny Slate, Jeff Goldblum. It? Yeah, Jenny Slate's in it. I didn't get far, that far. Yeah, it's, 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 and it's just, it almost could be a play. It's one of those, it's one ah. of those kind of like, this could have been like a four set play mm. you know big big production as she bounces between the rooms as she bounces between the rooms oh interesting and i i was thoroughly charmed by it i oh. couldn't i couldn't sleep the other night like it's not it's not a great movie but it's a movie that i will definitely go back and watch again just because the set design in the world is exceptional you I, know I, what I, you said about everything you said about that movie including that it's ensemble cast bouncing between rooms set design could apply also to bad times at el royale oh i haven't oh, seen that yet. I, I saw that last night how is it 
uh, I'm a, a, I sigh not be. Uh, I sigh because I will be honest. I was disappointed because I have very high expectations. It's this Drew, is Goddard, Drew Goddard. Drew Goddard. Right, and yeah. Drew Goddard, of course, his directorial debut was um, Cabin in the Woods. Cabin in the Woods. Which is, he's also written a bunch of wonderful. He films. wrote co-wrote The Martian, the screenplay. He is a big producer on the first season of Daredevil, mm -hmm. which we all love. Kind of lost. He uh, no. no, it came from Angel. Oh, that's uh, right. And Joss, the Joss Whedon worlds. And he also co-wrote Cabin in the Woods, of course. Uh, and Cloverfield, he mm -hmm. he wrote that as well. So very Wonderful. strong Big screenwriter. Big fans of Drew Goddard here on the podcast. Yeah. And this was the long anticipated second film after Cabin in the Woods. And it felt like it felt like a mix. It felt like I was watching an updated uh, Two Days in the Valley. Remember yeah, that? I love Pulp that movie. Fiction. So <laughs> like, like at some point we have to rank. Like this is actually a good accidental film festival. Is all of the bad Pulp Fiction knockoffs? <laughs> yeah. it's it like does. Two Days in the Valley. Go and anyway, yeah, it's and, and it feels it's a little bit like that kind of Tarantino knockoff. In right. that, if you're gonna have Albino a story, alligator. yeah. That with with mysterious characters that come together where the spaces are important and that you have these title cards in between the scenes, mm -hmm. oh just boy. like Hateful Eight, Jeff right. Bridges is in it. Does um, he destroy a priceless guitar? No, he doesn't do that. <laughs> That's good. But he does destroy something important. Can you priceless. imagine being the director that pitches that to him? Oh so, no, it's 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 Kurt Russell. It's Kurt, yeah, it's Kurt Russell destroys guitar. the guitar. That's right. It's not even Jeff Bridges, yeah. but he plays like the, the Kurt Russell it's, character. You, Ten years from now, you'll be some up up and coming director going, Kurt, this will be a great moment oh, for the God. audience and. Kurt will stare at them and go, too soon. <laughs> sorry, I interrupted. Norm. No, it's, it's sorry. Uh, um, and uh, this is also something that would, would have better played as a play, I think. Oh, okay. another or, play. Or an immersive theater. Like, hmm. I, just to be clear, I think I, I really... Like Hotel Artemis, I felt rewarded at the end for pushing through. Right, okay. I, I I had the same moment early on when when uh, when Sophia Sophia Patella is mm -hmm. talking to Charlie Day in the bar. I'm like these these characters are all bad. Yeah. Everybody here is bad, and it's almost like they're wearing cards that go, "I'm bad." Yeah, mm. well, I mean they are. Well, I look. I also uh, I love Dave Batista. I I think he's undersung. He's very good in this. He's wonderful. He plays he plays a different. It's a little more nuanced role than he. When she it, calls him bad. fatty, and he's like, "I'm not fat." <laughs> <laughs> he, he it's it's in, you guys should watch the movie i like to, i think we, we should talk about it more well, look you, we're all, we're burying the lead because yeah. I believe, oh, I, I, but before we bury the lead okay. I'm, i was i had other segues oh, planned oh, in. Oh, you mentioned yeah. jenny slate jenny slate also <laughs> wasted in the movie venom which i also saw last week which oh. is another san francisco movie which am and the wasp is but venom i think portrays san francisco a little bit better total just popcorn movie enjoyable um uh, and uh, I think. Do you see a Star Is Born yet? And then, and then, and then the Star Is Born. No segue there. That one highly recommended. If you have a chance to watch that in I've been some to type the of Dolby Atmos, oh. that song "Shallow" is incredible. I think Lady Gaga is going to get her egot at some point real soon. I I, th I think uh, the the articles about how they mixed. Uh, a Star is Born how they did all the vocals on site at places like Glastonbury Music Festival oh, and wow. Coachella and yet didn't let the audience hear the audio so they got what? yeah it made over four years uh, Bradley Cooper huge like he pushed this project forward I think, I think originally uh, it was another uh, Clint Eastwood was supposed to direct it oh yeah that's just and, what I want to see is and I Clint, think Clint you know, wasn't Pink supposed to be the Star is Born or no, no, Beyonce. Beyonce Beyonce was supposed that, to be that track and, and I think <laughs> it's Can't tough argue because that. Bradley Cooper is still too young I think to play that grizzled like older rock star role that like the Keith Urban role a little bit mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, but He's clearly very passionate about this project, co-produced by Live Nation, which is how they just like on Coachella. They just had, let's keep the the stages up for one extra day and then well, get so all your shots. So that was what in. was I thought was really cool and incredibly efficient, right? So they have these incredible shots from uh, from the trailer and in the movie where you see them on stage in front of eighty thousand people. And what do they do? Shoot the crowds one day and the well. Stage so what the they next? did was they managed to grab five to seven minute slots between bands at these festivals where the actors would go out and the cameras would get those key shots. They would sing the song, they get those key shots, and then after the festival closed, they'd keep the sets up for a day or two and, and get, get all their reverse angles. Yeah, right. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. But even more than that, apparently the sound ops were running like 30 separate signals all at once, mixing uh, grabbing all the ambient sound, and they had uh, they 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 had a way that they had. You know how in CG, uh, John Knoll I think pioneered this technique of bringing out the silver ball 
that they put in the middle of the set, and that allows yeah, USC, them to extrapolate. Light stage. It's called, it allows yeah. them to extrapolate all the lights that were yeah. on stage and replicate them digitally. So they were doing that sonically. They wow. they oh. built this thing that allowed them to grab not, whether white noise or pink noise or some type of methodology for grabbing the ambient sound of being on the stage at those concerts and mix that into these live mixes wow. so that according to them all of the vocals in the movie were recorded i'm so, I'm, I'm mansplaining a movie i haven't seen so is it mixed <laughs> is it mixed as if you're standing on the stage the audio mix a, a little bit i mean the cameras are very dynamic and, okay. and you can see the behind the scenes shots they have city can ops like you know dancing around the singers oh you can um, actually see that and and you um you, you can see in the behind the scenes photos. Oh, okay, got it. Um, and it's not like that tight because there's a lot of movement. The sound doesn't move around the theater like that, but definitely feels like the best in theater concert experience you could have. They paid cool. so close attention to the sound. I've watched the video of, of Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga singing Shallow like 25 times. I like can't and that's stop not, watching that, it. That may be the best song in the film, but it's like there are two other songs in the film that are just as good oh. and just as cathartic in the moment. Like even if you've listened to the soundtrack, which I think has like dialogue from the film, yeah. you kind of follow the, the thread of the film, <laughs> like twenty like 26 tracks or something. Even if you've listened dozens of times, the film will still give you the feels. Can't wait. And... Um, I have yeah, to go see that. It's really, really good. Um, also, really good. All right, let's let's. Well, let's, so here's the thing: is that the, the, the point of this conversation is probably in the title for the podcast today, right? I'm, so, just, I'm not even gonna. Put it <laughs> they, they got to they earn it. Um, yeah. So we, we're finally doing the MCU list, is what you're saying. <laughs> uh, uh, it's time to talk about about space. The final frontier. Yeah, exactly. These, these oh, I want, you know what? Before we get to it, <laughs> let's do oh, it. I watched. I also there was a, a, a lot of airplane a rides of, this week. A bunch huh? of airplane. I've been to like six cities in the last three weeks. Okay. Um, so there's been a lot of movie watching. Uh, I watched Star Trek 2009, which is, if anything, better than you remember. Oh, the Chris Pine. Uh -huh. yeah, the, the first, first Abrams. Abrams. I, th I actually. I like all three of those a lot. I, I, I do too, but the first one, I, seriously, the first five minutes of the first one with the dissolution oh, the of the ship and yeah. uh, uh, the Hemsworth, uh, Chris Hemsworth. And, uh, the, and the, silent, the silent. Dude, that movie holds up 100%. That, 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 the, 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 when the shuttle leaves the Enterprise <laughs> and it goes silent and the score stops as and everything. Screams, as in she labor. screams in labor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it is. I like I got yeah I got arm no. chills and and Jacino's sc uh, score is um, yeah wow. phenomenal okay but we're not talking about that kind of space we're talking not we're Zachary, talking nonfiction space. Zachary Kinto is in Hotel Artemis as well oh Very good. <laughs> actually and the line that made me laugh out loud on the plane was when Kirk offers the Romulans a uh, 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 safe harbor. And Zachary Quinto goes, what are you doing? And he said, I'm showing compassion. I thought you'd like that. It's logical. And Zachary Quinto goes, no, not really. <laughs> um, sorry, Norm, I'm going to break you for one more second. But I watched um, I watched Tag this I weekend. I did that too. Which is the movie where Jerry Renner broke both of his arms on like the first week of shooting. What? Yeah. yeah. It's oh, that's okay. I saw that on somebody else's was watching that on the plane. So, so I it's, saw it from a distance. It's a movie it that lets terrible. him be as badass as uh, the most badass in the ensemble as opposed to when he's Hawkeye and he's like the least powered. Well, but I mean, when he's mission in Mission Impossible, he's, he's you know. He broke both his arms? Broke both his arms in the first week of filming. On a what stunt. did they do? Uh, they put green screen casts on him. And What was the stunt? Uh, it was the chair one when he climbed uh, up the 30 chairs. You know, when you stack chairs and they're wobbly yeah, and yeah. he's on the top. And then yeah. he did a whole sliding thing where he was on the. He did it again he after he broke off. his arms because he wow. didn't realize he'd broken them. Um, oh my gosh. It's, it's, so that movie, the first, I thought the first like act and a half were really, really interesting. And then I completely got bored by the end. But, it, the, but the stunt work and the effects are pretty good in the beginning. It looks it looks terrible. It's very dumb. So <laughs> it's extraordinarily <laughs> dumb. Okay. It's, it's one of those films where it's based on a true story. Right. The, the, yeah, yeah. And, no, I know. The, the and pitch, I know the story. And the pitch is that they set you know, up the pitch in the, the these friends yeah. play have been playing this game of tag forever. But for of course, yeah. in the real world, that may be novel and fun. But when you fictionalize it, like th there's so much more interesting fiction you it, could write. Now, the thing I will point out, completely unrelated to the plot, is at the very end of the movie, they to to emphasize this is a true story because they're like, this story isn't really that great, but. If you believe it was a true story, if you know, then then that was a cool thing. They show the Wall Street Journal front page in which the story appeared, and it's a fake Wall Street Journal. <gasps> what? Because, because if you pull up from that day, it wasn't on the, the story front page. that it was not. It was it technically was like a, a small paragraph, like you know, uh -oh. it was not the top story. 
So they had a, <sighs> they photoshopped a Wall Street Journal to emphasize that it was on the quote unquote the front page of the this Wall whole, Street Journal. This whole film industry is living a lie. <laughs> um, it was it was. Uh, I enjoyed, I enjoyed so, the first two thirds. Uh, uh, what is the origin story of the game of tag? Who was the first man to get tagged? So the the upshot is Jerry. They five five friends played. John sure. Hamm. Yeah. Um, Jake Johnson. Jake Johnson. Ed Helms. Yeah, and uh, I can't remember the other Hannibal guys. Hannibal Burris. Hannibal Burris. Hannibal yeah. Burris and Jeremy Renner. And, right. And Jeremy Renner is the only one of them that's never been tagged. So they're all like like your hot tub time machine. They're all in different places <laughs> right, in that's their what life. It, that's what it looks some like. Of looks like are, some of them machine. are having good lives. Some of them, yeah, eh, yeah, not right. so much. All right. And, you know, yeah. Okay. And, yeah. But another movie came out this last week. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Uh, Damien Chazelle's third film. How is it that he's only made three films? And he's like in his 30s. Yeah. Really? So he's annoyingly competent. And, <laughs> and you have to be that competent to make this film. It's so his other two films are Whiplash and, and La La Land. La La Land. And this as a huge departure, it would seem. Uh, and the first film that he didn't write, he just directed uh, First Man, of course. We're talking about the Neil Armstrong uh, biopic. Uh, yeah. Starring uh, starring Ryan Gosling. And uh, Claire Foy. And Claire Foy wife. as Janet Armstrong. Uh, an amazing, amazing supporting cast. Yeah, I, I mean, as we've seen with a lot of space films, and there there aren't a lot of films, there are a lot of films, but there aren't a lot of that stand out. Apollo 13, of course, is probably the high bar still, I would say, I in totally this room. I totally agree, yeah. Uh, for, for, for Apollo for real era. real life stuff? R- yes, real, real life would, space I would, films. I think I'd probably put right stuff up there above Apollo Well, and 13. I think that's uh, the, the other one I was going to mention, right? There are yeah. two flavors. Apollo 13, I think, is more... Uh, it's kind of maybe, a lion. Yeah, it's a lion. It's like that area a little bit. Exactly, right? right? The more drama. It's a more yeah. dramatic storytelling, whereas the right stuff borders on wanting to be like a documentary. Well, the right stuff, if you've ever read the Tom Wolf book, which I highly recommend if you haven't, um, is very true to the book. Like it is very much a, I am a guy here telling the story of these seven people. And... I watched it a, couple, a few months ago, actually, for the first it's time in 20 well? years. Really, really well. I would, I would have thought so, yeah. Absolutely terrific. Jeff Goldblum's in it. Oh, right. He's one of the reporters, right? Yeah, exactly. Or the, he runs, he runs, runs, into, the he runs yeah. into the room mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. every time. Um, and uh, parts of the right stuff were shot here in San Francisco because Gary Gutierrez, who used to be my boss at Colossal Pictures, was the effects director really? on the film. So, yeah, uh, oh. if you look at old episodes of Mythbusters, you'll see some uh, airplanes on the wall, and some of those were from the right stuff, what? special effects shots. Oh. Yeah, that's amazing. In that's fact, the awesome. giant globe that hung above Jamie's machine shop was built for one of the uh, looking back at the planet shots from right. Really? Mm -hmm. Now, the framing of those two films with Apollo 13 and the right stuff are very different also, right? Right stuff is about Mercury Mm -hmm. and Apollo 13 is about one mission. And you can fill two hours, two and a half hours with either of those. First Man is interesting in that it is not one mission or one program. It is one person's journey. Well, that's exactly it. the it's process. An, it's an yeah. incredibly personal, incredibly personal film in which uh, that leaps forward in time, sometimes abruptly five years. Mm-hmm. Um, but each of those leaps is not done by, oh, see how far they've gone in the Apollo program. Each of those leaps involves uh, Armstrong's family. And in that it is a very quiet. If you're going expecting either right stuff or uh, 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 sorry, Apollo 13, Apollo 13 you, this isn't either of those. It's it, a very quiet it's, and personal film. It's more reminiscent of From the Earth to the Moon, the HBO uh, docu series from like 20 years ago now, probably, where they each each episode told the story of like one small part of the program, mm-hmm. and and I thought it was like it wasn't at all what I was expecting going into the theater. You know, I went in expecting Apollo 13 and the big. You know, the, the trailer is sold a here's the story of Apollo 11 and yeah. here's the tense moment right before the, you know, as Buzz and Neil are approaching the landing. Which site. they have. They, it's in there. Yeah. It's in like like, like last mm-hmm. 10 minutes maybe. Yep. But, but that's not the crux um, of the film. But the crux of the film is, hey, here's here's this human being. Uh, here's the story of him and his family. And here's the toll it took on these normal human beings who were struck, thrust into extraordinary circumstances. And that's the thing that I found the most um affecting about it was they uh, Chazelle uh, shows really really clearly how what it is to be the spear point of new inventions to do impossible things the, the um we Gene and I went and saw it in the screening and uh, Ariel was there and afterwards I think she said that it's it reminded her of the quote that he's famous for uh, about being just the man on the at the point of a hundred thousand people and that's very much what the film felt like absolutely it felt, felt very true to what 
like I know of him. And it's not a particularly flattering portrayal of Neil Armstrong in a lot of ways. Well, it, it like look, I know obviously being a, a space junkie, I'm very familiar with Armstrong's uh, incredible humility, his desire to make sure that all of the engineers that got him to the moon and back are celebrated, not just him. Uh, I appreciate his reticence to create a cult of personality, and it that comes all the way across in the film. Claire Foy is phenomenal she is. as really his good. partner, and I, I that you know a genuine partner in their in their relationship, dealing with huge and difficult amounts of loss from the loss of his daughter to the loss of his fellow pilots. Um, I don't know if you recognized uh, uh, his pilot, Elliot. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. His compadre, uh, Patrick Elliot, Fugit. Patrick Fuji from uh, almost like, famous. Like, That's almost famous. Again. <laughs> it took me, it took me two scenes to figure oh, yeah. it out. I, I, I Gemini eight. Yeah. Uh, no, Gemini. no, 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 no. This was the other, the other civilian pilot. Uh, when they sat down in the trial, the other civilian pilots oh, got it, had got it, a few yeah, yeah. He, he died in the T-38. Yeah, 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 and I also, uh, the actor that plays Buzz Corey Walter, Stroll. Cor I, also from Ant-Man the also Wasp. I'm oh, sorry, Ant-Man. Yeah, Look, yeah. he's one of oh, those right. actors. Yeah. He's, he's like a, I swear he's a little like a, a Gene Hackman. Like you put him in your movie, your movie's going to be better. He's always going to come yeah. in and just kill at the part you've given him. Well, and the guy who played... Um, God, one of the Apollo 1 astronauts. You're talking about Ed White? Ed White, yeah. Jonathan... Nope. Nope. It's, it's not, not the guy from Terminator Salvation? It is the guy from Terminator yeah, Salvation. Yeah, what's his name? Um, oh, God. <laughs> I was going to talk about Gus Grissom. He's but the one that has Shea the... Shea Wigwam is Gus Grissom and uh, Jason... Um, Jason. I got this. <laughs> Come on, Norm. You got to continue talking. You got okay. to fill, oh, fill. So, uh, 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 <laughs> Gus Grissom. Julia kept on turning... My wife kept on turning to me and going... Who was it? Who was that? And she's like, I only know the right stuff. So who was that in the right stuff? I was like, Fred Ward played him in the right stuff. So I, well, so, I'm doing all this cross comparison. Well, and, 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 yeah. It was so funny because one of the things that I realized is that they cast people who looked like the people who played these people in the right stuff. I think maybe more than the people who were the actor, the actual people. Um, I, the Apollo 1 fire was so upsetting, by the no, way. So, yeah. so there were three kind of key moments. There's yeah. the death of his yeah. daughter in the beginning and the yeah. X-15 so X flight. Intensely dealt with. The X-15 both, both, flight. Both Jason what, Edgerton. Jason oh. Edgerton. No. Is that right? No. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. Is, the, oh, my God. You're thinking Joel uh, Edgerton. Edgerton. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, I'm sorry. Continue. Go ahead, Will. Um, but, but yeah, so, so it opens. The cold open is the X-15 flight, right? Yeah. It is. And, it is. and like, it's a terrifying moment. Like... The, the that X-15 suit, by the way, built by Ryan Nagata. Oh, yeah. We had it here in the shop. It's, it's so pretty. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Are we into spoiler territory, I guess, now? Or do we want to talk about yeah, suits absolutely. and stuff for a Look, little bit? everyone knows how the story turns out. They, they, make, they make it. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they succeed. <laughs> Two dudes step on the moon. <laughs> this, I think this is a movie where we're not really worrying about spoilers. In fact, well, well, we could talk about scene after scene. Jason Clark. I, Jason Clark. Yes. Oh, good job, Norman. <laughs> That's, uh, he's got the youngest brain. Yeah, I, I I never would have gotten. No, that I one. didn't. Yeah, it was the, not even going to get close. But sorry, X fifteen. You know, so it starts with the X fifteen fight. So it's it's kind of structured. It reminded me a lot of the Steve Jobs movie, the the Danny Boyle Steve Jobs movie. Uh, yes. In, um, in mm -hmm. that, you know, there's there's these kind of three key moments mm. in Neil Armstrong's life that are focused on. And then they they slot in the Apollo one fire because it's also it's also an important moment because of the death of Ed White and the yeah, yeah. the impact on the program. But it starts with the X fifteen flight, the death of his of his child when he was a test pilot in Northern California. It goes. Uh, the next one is the Gemini Eight mission, mm -hmm. which is the first docking mission, and there's a there's a failure on the totally capsule. Totally intense, and yeah. Super. I like that was a sequence I found physically exhausting. Oh, I, and I think uh, exhausting is going to describe the the three main flight sequences yeah. because the way that Damon Chazelle and his cinematography uh, cinematographer works on this is makes you feel like you're in the in the cockpit, I, in the space. And it's I, very claustrophobic. I will have to tell you in a tiny way in which I've been lucky enough in my life to sit in devices that I have built to do ridiculous things. Um, the movie is full of these little moments of camaraderie between naturally um, n untalkative astronauts. These moments where two people and who are excellent at their jobs stop and are like, wow, like, right. And I, ha I, I connected with that moment because I've been there with Heinemann. Yeah. Right. I've been there where he and I are the, oh, yeah, a little going with This is far out. Holy yeah, shit. and uh, it, yeah. It, that felt, again, every one of the emotional beats in the film felt so 
infused and had such roots through the through the plot and through the movie and through its characters. Well, so I I was get, like one of the things that struck me not not to skip around, but but I, I mean skip that around. moment the moment after they land on the moon, they're the first two men on the moon. They've survived this incredible journey. Yeah. They're at the head of a hundred thousand people, and they kind of look at each other, smile, and shake hands, and then go go back to work. And and the way in which again Chazelle makes you realize that these. We were recently working on some pieces of Mercury hardware here in the shop. And one of the things that's shocking when you lay that out, and you guys both had this experience, is, oh, my God, this thing was a tin can. Yeah. Oh, well, and, and they captured that perfectly. Yes, like that's the, the thing. The, the film constantly shows you just how tenuous the barriers between them and total destruction was. Even, even like this, especially on the, on the Gemini stuff and the X-15 stuff, it, it's a little bit softened on the shift to Apollo because it feels like third generation we kind of finally started figuring out how to build that stuff a little bit more mm -hmm, reliably mm -hmm. or a little bit more uh, polished but but yeah it was it especially like and it, it was really sold by the cinematography in the film where when he's in a high g high g situation in the x15 the the close up the shot that you're seeing is from the astronaut's perspective always mm -hmm. so you see his face you feel it's a really tight lens you feel how small that space is and how yeah. cramped he is in the couch rickety the it sounds rickety yeah. it yeah. looks rickety they work really hard to show that and well you, you see the close-ups of the of the dials and when you, you know i don't yeah. know if this came across but the screen shake like the the camera was moving constantly giving a ton of motion on those dials and so it's a it's when you're seen in the theater it's a 20 foot tall three inch dial that's blowing from left to right yeah. across a wide yeah. screen and it's a little hard to watch. Yeah, like it I was agree. challenging. Yeah. Um, but I like as the only person I know that's been in a fighter jet that's gone faster than the speed of sound. Like, is that is that what it's like when oh, you're God. under G load? Like all you can <laughs> no, look no, at no, is no, no, no. I'm a I'm a TV personality. They wouldn't subject me to that. Oh, kind they didn't of... put you under. No, and a F A eighteen is the, the 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 Hornet is such a ludicrously stable machine that no, I didn't experience. There was any... no shaking or anything. No, like no, no, that. no, okay. no, no. These th that is that's the apex of our of our. It's not the apex, but but like that is a machine built to do that. This is the sequence in the X-15 is like, that's the first plane to go this crazy fast. Yeah. And when he's bouncing off the atmosphere, that was so, so intense. Scary. Yeah. And, and you talk <clears throat> about the shaky camera. It's not just in the cockpit, but even everything is handheld. 98% uh, of the films looks handheld when they're on earth. So the moments with Claire Foy, who is amazing in this because of their relationship, even the parts where they're not in conflict, it looks like home movies from the it 60s does. and, and the intentionally. So yeah, uh, it, the camera floats around. It's it's loose, and the only time the camera is still is after they land. Oh! And the moment they land, he steps and he says the line, and oh. the, 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 he takes the breath in. The sound goes quiet, and there's a long pan, pan that goes mm -hmm. all the way around, and that's the only time it's a steady it's shot just on sticks. Wow! Huh. Um, I also i I really appreciated the family sequences. I, the the way in which the movie treats children. Um, the children aren't in the movie for much more than like maybe five or eight minutes of screen time. Oh, all a, told, they're 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 present, but often, they're present right? throughout yeah. the whole film in a way that feels really natural and uh, 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 has a lot of veracity to it. Well, a, a lot of the storytelling about the relationship with the astronauts and their families happens in the context of you know we're working six days a week on this crash program to beat the Russians. Yeah. But we take Sunday afternoons off and have barbecues yeah. with our coworkers <laughs> and their and their spouses, and like a, there's a t a ton of hey the wives are all having a hard time the spouses are all having a hard time the astronauts are all worried about this incredible thing that they're doing and the fact that they're going to get beat by the Russians and have been consistently beaten by the Russians every step along the way yeah and it's it's a fascinating kind of look that, that actually Tom Wolf hints at in the right stuff. Hmm. Um, but it doesn't come come across so much in the movies. Like you see, you see the funerals of the test pilots right, in the right, right stuff, but you don't see kind of the aftermath of that so much. It was just the cost of doing business. And ultimately, even though it's a a very personal film about one person's journey through the incredible thing that is the space program, I feel like it stands as a wonderful testament to the incredible effort of the entire space program, right? And it does that by just shining a mirror on, shining a light on this one person and saying, you know, 
it's the film makes it really clear he is not at all alone in his excellence and being able to do the thing it is this incredible support network that does it and you get to understand that through watching how it affects this one person in their family the the one thing that well there are two things about me out the cinematography is i understand like it's one of those things i absolutely understand why you shoot those capsule sequences with the super tight cameras and you don't give the beautiful exterior shots because you want the audience to feel like what it felt like to be one of the astronauts inside the LEM going down, you know, for the very first time. I, 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 I love those exterior shots. You like shots. the exterior shots? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, um, and then the, the other thing was I felt like, like I didn't, I had to go and look on IMDb to see who the kind of supporting characters were. I like, I, I wasn't sure if, uh, Kyle Chandler was Deke Slayton yeah, or Gordon uh, Gordon Cooper, but he, he was he was Deke Slayton, yeah. right? And yeah. and you you pick that up throughout the thing, uh, but it was a little bit it was a little bit unclear. So it's really interesting times. who this film was for, because it was yeah, like you know, is it for people who are really into space, or is it for a little wider audience? It feels uh, like it was for the, people who are really into space. I, I but I'm not so sure. I find myself very curious about the next. The, about the rest of Chazelle's career. This is a really interesting place to go after uh, the success of La La Land. Um, and I feel like I really appreciate the fact that it's not in the same line at all. It feels like these feel like... Well, there's a thread. There's one thread thematically yeah. from Whiplash to La La Land to First Man, and it's that these professions and these accomplishments that are glamorized in public he pulls the curtain back a little bit on that, mm. whether it's from musicians to yeah. acting Hollywood to the heroes in our space history. Uh, he does. He definitely pulls that curtain a little back. That's I mean, it's, true. it's definitely not like the thing. The thing Gina said after we saw this was that it seemed like the kind of movie that couldn't be made until now. Right. It's it's a more honest, raw look at this at this time in history. It was now 40, 50 years ago than we maybe were capable of. It, when we were kids, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and and I'm I'm you know I, I kind of feel like like uh, Chazelle's taking a um, like the Danny Boyle path, right? Like a, instead of instead of getting bogged down in one genre and becoming yeah. a genre director, he seems to be kind of like spreading his wings and trying a little bit of everything, which I I really appreciate. I do too. I do too. I, I so I as a space nut, I really enjoyed this film. As a film nut, I thought it was really lovely. Uh, and I thought I was surprised as a person with kids, uh, how sensitively it really showed the toll on a family of, of that kind of endeavor. Yeah. yeah. So highly rated. Obsession. I mean, very, very satisfying I, I would, night at the movie. I would say that the theme of Chazelle's work is probably obsession. Because <laughs> if you look at Whiplash and La La Land, and hmm. this, these are all I don't know about La La Land. The dedicated, determined, absolutely people, and the toll that takes. I, 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 feel, I, I really, I walked away from the singing. It was a really unkind portrait of, I, like, probably honest, but, but he, he did not paint a, a wonderful picture. You know, he painted Neil Armstrong as a bad dad. Well, a, a good dad and also a bad dad at the same time, which is, I think, how most dads probably feel like they are at the end of the day. <laughs> the there, but for the grace. Yeah, and and um, you definitely a bad husband. Mm. You know, so one thing I'm curious about, I want to get your thoughts on and I want to spoil this part of the film. Uh, but there is something that happens on this that has historical, if it's true, would have historical significance, but at very best is apocryphal, but probably fiction. I had never heard of this. before. I, I went back and did some fairly extensive Internet research. There was literally the only thing I was able to find were people who had seen the screener, uh, 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 you know, uh, first showing. Yeah. And were asking the same question. Uh, look, yeah. I, I, I didn't think that that moment was necessary. I understood why in Hollywood's desire for a script that ties up and neatly creates circles because Hollywood loves scripts that call back to themselves, that that was a satisfying moment for the film to have, but I didn't think it was necessary. Yeah. It wasn't necessary for me to emotionally connect with the film across the full arc of Armstrong's. Story. It just felt in, in for a film that has so much attention to detail on the technical aspects and who knows about the emotional truths of the film because mm -hmm, that's, mm -hmm. that's for Neil Armstrong and his family. Right. Uh, it was, I also felt it was unnecessary. I felt it was, if true, it would have been amazing. Yeah. But realizing now that that was just 
made for the emotional satisfaction of the film, I felt like yeah, it was a little too much. If it, if it, it look, that whole thread was, you know, every, every parent's worst nightmare. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. And losing a losing a child. Yeah, and and he, the way that was portrayed early on, where he was obsessed with everything he could to save his daughter. Right. He was, he was literally yeah. reading medical textbooks and, you know, re- reading the x-rays and, and things like that to see, see if he could pick up something that the doctors had missed. And he's a smart, he's a smart engineer. Like there's a, yeah. that, that yeah. stranger things have happened. Um, but yeah, I, I, I look, it didn't, it didn't strike me as unfair. I, but I did, I had questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so much more we can say about this film. We've talked about a lot of films on this the, podcast. The costumes are exceptional. Costumes are exceptional. The costume work and Both again, Brian Nagata, Brian Nagata built a bunch of this parts, but the 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 bulk of the uh, uh, big su- spacesuits were built by Chris Gilman at Global mm-hmm. Effects. And the, there's a ton of real close-up spacesuit porn. Yeah. You, you get to see a lot of connectors going <laughs> Excuse on. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so delightful. <laughs> 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 snap right into place. My wife turned to me and she's like, good sound effects. Chink, chink, chink. You need you need a foley guy in here all the time when you're putting the suits on. Oh, Just, I have one. It's going on in my head no, all no, the no, time. No, no, no. But I mean, when you make a video, you need to have the ch- chunk for when. Uh, all right. Yeah. Normal. So let's pan the yeah. camera off to the side. And... Exactly. <laughs> um, the uh, the period costumes and and the set decoration, like they did a lovely job rebuilding. I guess mid century modern Houston. I think they did it in Roswell, Georgia, is what oh, I read. Really? Uh, yeah. It was really beautifully done and very subtle. Um, again, th- this is Chazelle's third film. He is in his 30s. Uh, we, have a, <laughs> we have a lot to look forward to from this smart young man. I'm very hopeful. <laughs> and we will be, there will be more coverage of First Man Untested uh, this week and next. Uh, oh, we cool. have a video. A, oh, cool. Yeah, so we have a video with Ryan Nagata who brought up some of the actual costumes worn on the film that he made, uh, including the X-15 suit. That will be on the site uh, later this week. And that really, we're filming an episode of Off World, which, which we'll be talking about it as well. Uh, so lots more. So you have a chance. We didn't go into full spoilers. Watch the film this week and enjoy our discussions of it in the coming weeks. Adam, are you going to build any of the suits from this movie? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. I think you have all of them, but the X-15 suit, right? Uh, this is true. I believe I yeah. have uh, one of each. Uh, yeah, because they didn't go into the A7LB. They stopped with the A7L. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> uh, okay. Anything else? Ah, yeah. uh, those are the big things. Uh, also, if you're a member, uh, a couple of nice things coming out for you this week. We have a new series with uh, Sean and Jeremy. They worked for five months on a oh, brand new man. arcade cabinet from scratch, including the design of the. It's only five the, months because it felt yeah. like several years. It felt like a long time, <laughs> but it, that whole journey, we're, uh, do- we document the whole thing, and the process is being rolled out on tested right now. And for members, uh, we have our annual gift. We'll be revealing very soon on the site, so stay tuned for that. The reason the gift has been late is all my fault i'm very sorry it's worth it it's worth the wait it's worth the wait um thank you so much uh will for joining us um i i don't know if i'll be around next week i i, I may be uh you could be off i could be off for we'll, a month we'll be here oh okay. yeah. you're in the window i'm in the window you, the, the young coming. chan is coming yeah. oh that's right Have you picked out a right. name yet norm no nah, there's no upside to talking about that no 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 should name your kid seven <laughs> okay let's go Soda. let's go we Soda. gotta go <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye.